So good evening everyone, uh, my name is Michael G0POT and tonight I'm going to talk about SOTA or Summit on the Air. Um, I've been uh, a, a, an active participant of the SOTA um, scheme for, for quite a number of years now, really love doing it and I'm really enthusiastic about sharing it with other people. But I guess the questions that I want to answer tonight are, what is it? Why do we, would we think about doing it? And how do we go about doing it? And when I look at the how we do it, I'm going to split it into two parts. I'm going to talk about the, the walking, the, the hill climbing part, and then I'm going to talk about the portable or operating part because they're slightly different beasts um, and we need to think about them, them separately. So what exactly is SOTA? First of all, it's, it's not a contest. It's a, a radio awards program. Um, so it's not about short, sharp, um, trying to get as many contacts in as you possibly can. It can be as relaxed or as contest-like as, as you like. Um, the whole aim of it really is to encourage uh, portable operation and specifically from hills or mountainous locations. So I'm a big fan of portable operation anyway, but uh, the, the beauty of SOTA is it encourages you to climb um, to some fairly small hills, but uh, also some serious mountains. The whole idea was originally uh, devised by a chap called John, G3WGV. Uh, um, I think he mulled over this, this idea for a, a couple of years um, before he came across um, Richard, G3CWI, who you may know from Soda Beams, the owner of Soda Beams. He had a website called the European Adventure Radio website. Um, and I think John saw that saw that there was somebody else who had similar ideas and aspirations to him, got together with Richard and they started to flesh out this idea of SOTA and they got a few more people involved and about 15 years ago, back in 2002, they finally launched um, this, this awards programme. At that time it was just in the UK. It's since grown uh, quite significantly. It now covers uh, roughly 55 countries, I think, uh, are involved now. So it's, it's got quite a, a wide uptake. So how does it work? Well, qualifying hills are worth points. What is a qualifying hill? that can depend on what country you're in. So in the UK, what that means is any hill with a prominence of more than 150 metres. That is, it, it has a 150 metre fall off in, in every direction. Some countries, it differs. Um, the UK obviously has got a reasonable selection of hills. Some countries have got a very flat, some countries have got hundreds of really big hills. Um, and I think it, it can differ from, from country to country exactly what qualifies. There's two parts to it. There's a kind of activator side and a chaser side. So chasers are the people that sit at home in their nice, warm, comfortable shacks chasing the people who are actually climbing the hill. So they're trying to make contacts with um, people who are activating the summits. And obviously then the activators are the ones that are doing the hard work. They're the ones that are doing the climbing, getting out in the hot, the cold, setting up their portable stations um, and activating these, these summits. As I said, each summit is worth a number of points. The simplest summits are just worth one point. Um, slightly more complex or, or harder summits are worth two, and then it goes up four, six, eight, and ten. So the hardest summits, the mountains, are worth ten points. So there's a range of scores that you can achieve by activating and working people on summits, and that means it's it's quite nice because it can appeal to people with different abilities. You don't necessarily have to be a mountain climber and go out there and do all those ten pointers. You can do some quite simple um, summits and just earn one or two points for a, for a summit. The summit is only um, worth points to you once a year. So if I go and activate my local hill, I can earn my one point for, for it. But if I activate it again, which I can do, and I can give away points to other people, I won't earn another point for that. And similarly, if I chase someone uh, working on, say, Snowden, I can earn my 10 points for, for working them, but that's, that's it for 12 months. If I work anyone else on there, I'm not going to earn points for that. 
And the other thing they have is something called a winter bonus to acknowledge how difficult um, working and how miserable working on top of a hill can be uh, during the winter. Some summits can attract a winter bonus of three points. Uh, they tend to be the higher and more challenging um, summits. So if you work those, um, if you operate from those during the winter months, you can actually uh, earn an extra three points. So why do SOTA? Why take part? Well, for me, this picture kind of sums it up. Um, this is a view from Hluith uh, in Snowdonia. Um, the snowy peak to the right is um, Snowdon itself, and that little peak down in the uh, in the middle is another hill called Arran. Um, so those are three. These are three SOTA summits that I worked recently. It's just fantastic. I mean, the climbing. I like the the walking. I love the climbing. I love the outdoors. Being up on top of a mountain, watching the sun coming up, there's nothing better. And then to introduce a bit of amateur radio into that and making contacts from that is fantastic. The other great thing about SOTA is by operating from hilltops, you essentially become like a DX. There's lots of people out there, chasers, there's lots of people who want to work you and they're really excited to try and try and get you. So you find yourself at the bottom of little pile-ups. So as a, a way of working portably, where your radio might be very low power, your antennas might be very inefficient, actually you can work a huge number of stations because everyone wants to try and work you. So how do you then get involved? You're sucked in now, you love the look of this. How do you actually get involved? Well, a great starting point is to do some chasing. It'll introduce you to the whole concept. It'll get you used to the kind of um, overs that people are having from hilltops, those who like nice short, quick contest exchanges, those who like to have a little bit more of a, a chat and exchange some information. So doing a little bit of chasing is a great way to get started. Now, how do you go about finding stations to chase? Well, you can Obviously, have a tuner out in the hope that you can hear people calling CQ SOTA, and, and that's what uh, activators tend to do, they call CQ SOTA. But a great place to start is the SOTA Watch website at sotawatch.org. And here they have um, people can spot themselves, or other people can spot them. Um, and uh, highlight the summit that you're working on, the frequency and the mode you're working. This site also has an area to um, highlight activation. So if you're planning an activation, you can post that in advance so people can see that you're going to be on a hill on a certain day on a, at a certain time. Um, now, looking at the spots, let me just explain this. Um, we have the, the day, the time, the most recent spots are at the top followed by the call sign of the station that's working the summit. Uh, interestingly, American stations don't tend to use the slash P for portable um, activation. Um, most Europeans do. I don't think it's part of the UK license requirement anymore, but most, most uh, portable operators will still um, sign slash portable. This is then followed by a little identifier. This is the SOTA summit reference, and it's unique for every summit. So it has a prefix, which is the country or the association. So a country like America has quite a, a few uh, associations or areas. Um, each association is then broken down into to zones. So for instance, um, Wales, where I was operating uh, a couple of weeks ago, is broken down into three zones. And then each zone has uh, unique hill references from starting from number one. So this is a reference, a unique reference for a summit, and um, this is what the activator is going to be announcing when he's working from that location. Uh, the spotting also includes the frequency that's being used and the mode. Now, if you're um, operating CW, uh, you have the opportunity to either log into this website and, and spot yourself, um, or you can set up uh, an upcoming activation to say that you're going to be um, active on a hill, and then if RBN picks you up, 
um, the SOTA watch can link the two things and it automatically spots you. So where you see RBN hole, that is a, a system that's using RBN to automatically spot you based on a planned activation that you've entered into SOTA watch. There's also a way of doing this using um, SMS from your phone and we'll cover that when we talk a little bit about activating in a minute. So, so that's a great way of starting by chasing people and the best way to find stations to work um, who are activating summits is to use SOTA Watch. So you've had a go at that, you've enjoyed that, now you want to have a go on a hill yourself. So how are you going to find a summit to work? Another really good website for SOTA users is called sotadata.org.uk and it has something called the SOTA mapping project on it. Um, so if you go to the menu, you'll find SOTA mapping project as an option and you can select the country you're in. So we choose the association. Uh, here I've chosen Wales, but you can select um, your country of operation. You then choose the region. And as I said, uh, as it happens, uh, Wales is divided up into three regions, the north, the middle and the south, quite, quite simple. Um, and you can see that the, in the north of Wales that there, there are 77 summits. And then you can either select the summit you want to view or you can simply view the map now and it'll show you all of the summits that are available in that region. So this way you can use the map to find a summit that's close to you. Now you'll notice each of the summits has got a different colour and a different number and this is the number of points it's worth. Do you remember I said simple summits, one point, slightly harder, two points, and then they increase in hardness, four, eight, and 10 points. So those red 10 pointers are serious mountains. The eights are gonna be a really, really challenging hill as well. The six is starting to get a little bit less challenging, a little bit easier, but still a, 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 good, a good day's hiking probably. Um, four's easier still, and it gradually goes down. One, some, some one point hills you can actually drive to the top of. Um, so one's a good place to start and I recommend if you're going to have a go at a hill you find something that's local to you and that's either a one or a two point hill, a good starting point. Um, making it local is quite important. If, if you haven't operated portable before, the first time you get there you're going to make mistakes. You're going to forget the power lead, the microphone, that critical adapter that connects your radio to the antenna. You're, you're going to make those mistakes. So if you've travelled a long way that's really depressing. So, so go for a nice easy one point summit that's close to you. Um, so at this point, while we're talking about planning, let me start now splitting into the, the walking side of things, the hill climbing, and, the, and we'll do the radio separately in a moment. So we've gone to our SOTA data site and we found a summit that's close to us. So here now I'm looking at England, I'm looking at southern England, and this is my local summit. Um, I live not far from here. And if I click on the triangle, I get a lovely little box pop up, which tells me Walbury Hill, that's the name of my local hill, and a little bit of information about it. If I then click on the name, it takes me to um, a, a data page for my summit. Now this is really, really useful for activators. It has a little bit of information about the summit, um, including the grid reference, and we're going to use that in a minute. You can see how often it's activated and who's been activating it. So you can see I appear a few times in this list because it's my local summit. You can see what bands have been activated and how often. So that can give you some good information about whether maybe a summit is um, very easy for one setup and not so good for another. So if you can see a summit is never activated using two meters, there might be a really good reason for that. Like there's a paging system that causes lots of interference. But the critical thing here is these links um, at the bottom. These are links to people's blogs and information um, that people have captured about activating this particular hill. And this is so useful for you in planning your activity um, because it allows you to see where other people have parked, the challenges maybe they've had finding the route up, um, issues that they've had on the, on the summit itself. Maybe it was crowded with people, maybe there's nowhere to um, stick a dipole. Um, they, they can share 
share really important things with you, which is great to have that information before you travel a long way to actually go and have a, have a go yourself. So um, I tend to go through these links, um, read other people's blogs and find out some key information about the summit activation itself before I actually set out. So then what I do is I take that grid reference, Sierra Uniform 373616 in that, this case, and I go to streetmap.co.uk. Now, hopefully other countries have got something very similar um, in terms of being able to see ordnance survey maps. Those are maps with the height contour lines in them um, and details of um, not just the roads, but, but the countryside. Uh, and we're going to use this to help us plan. So here we can see um, my local hill, which is Walbury Hill. Uh, the summit is actually where the little blue triangle is, and that's a trig point. Um, now, the trig point doesn't necessarily have to be on a summit or the highest point. You can see this one to the left um, is actually not at the highest point. Um, they, they were used for, uh, obviously, um, uh, d d working out the, the mapping um, and uh, um, being able to, to map the height of various uh, points for, for map making, but they don't necessarily put them at the highest point. So be careful, not all, not all um, trig points are at the summit itself. I use this map now to look at where to park along with the blocks. Um, and, and I found from experience that it's a good idea to, to have a plan B with the parking. So I know that my local summit has a lovely little car park just here, which is plenty big enough for, for all the cars that you need there. Um, I can see there's another parking opportunity over to the right. Now I've been to summits where the car park that's marked, when you get there it's locked and you can't get in. Um, I've been to others where the, the only place to park is a little lay-by by the side of the road and some very, very nice person has parked a van right slap bang in the middle of it so you can't get any other cars in there. If you haven't planned for somewhere else to park, then sometimes it can be really challenging when you're actually on the ground to find another car parking area. Um, it's very difficult, to, uh, you haven't got the visibility, you can't see the terrain, you can't see where other possibilities are. So, so having these documented I think is really helpful and where possible I program these into my GPS as well um, in the car so that I can make my way straight to them. Um, from the map I can also look at the activation zone for this summit. Now the AZ or activation zone is um, a, an area that's within 25 vertical meters of the summit peak itself. Now the reason that so to do this is because um, some summits are very small and if you've got to share them with other hill users, other walkers, um, it could be very very inconvenient if you're plonked right on the top with a big aerial um, and they've got kids, dogs, um, people trying to enjoy the, uh, the, the summit as well. Um, so to try and give a little bit of flexibility with where you set up so that you don't have to be in the mix of things and um, they have a rule that as long as you're within 25 meters of the summit that's um, that's sufficient to activate it. So in this case, my summit is 297 meters. I can operate anywhere above 272 meters. So as you can see, 200, that's 280, 275. Um, that actually covers quite a big area. So my activation zone is very big. In fact, it, it almost takes in the car park, I think. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at the shape and, and the activation zone because when you get to the summit you may find the absolute peak is not a good place to set up and do radio. So being clear where, where you can set up is really helpful. Just on the point of the car park there, there are SOTA summits where the car park sits within the activation zone. But the idea of SOTA is that there's some climbing and some walking involved. It's not appropriate to drive to a summit and operate from inside your car. You should get out of the car uh, and preferably walk the last part to, to the summit. The, the flip side of that is SOTA aims to be inclusive. So we want people, everyone to be able to do it. And if you have mobility issues, then being able to park up near the activation zone and maybe set up outside your car with a separate power supply not being supplied by the car, that's absolutely fine.
So I tend to print out these maps and I take a paper map with me when I do a SOTR activation. Um, I can plot a route, I can see the route I want to take here, I've got a public right of way across this land. Um, as it happens, what the, the map doesn't show you is this is actually private land. Um, and although there's access to get to the trig point for walkers, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to operate up here without permission. But I can see that there's a public right of way across here, so I know I'm good to activate um, somewhere along there. I take a copy of this with me. I do take a mapping app on my phone, um, which I find really useful. But as you're gonna hear me say several times, batteries fail and uh, you can't guarantee that your mapping app on your phone is gonna be working for you. So I always have a paper backup. So that is the basic research beforehand. I've decided on the hill that I want to go to. I've printed myself out a map and decided where I'm going to park and where the activation zone is that I need to get into um, to, to activate the hill. The next key thing about getting out and actually starting walking is being safe. So dressing for SOTA. The one thing you'll really notice is the temperature at the bottom of the hill is more, more or less much higher than at the top of the hill. The weather at the top of the hill is always going to be cooler and colder. You're more exposed to the elements, more exposed to the wind. If you're climbing a significant height, there is a natural temperature difference. So a few weeks back, I was climbing uh, in Snowdonia, um, Mount Snowdon. Um, it was about four degrees in the car park and a brisk wind where I left. At the hilltop, it was uh, zero degrees. Uh, there was a 70 to 80 kilometer wind and the wind chill was about minus 10. And I'm telling you now, you really did feel it. So it's important to dress appropriately. Now, during a climb, you can get very hot and it's good to have lots of layers. You can add or remove layers as necessary. I always then take a wind waterproof shell. No, not thick, it's not gonna give me any warmth, but it just keeps the wind and keeps the, the rain off me. In fact, I take waterproof trousers and a waterproof coat. And if you take a, a, a nice thin waterproof shell, you can roll those up and put them in your backpack while you're actually walking. Now, if you're just walking, it's great. You can walk up a hill, you build up a nice bit of temperature. When you get to the top, you can enjoy the view, have a nice cup of tea, and then make your way down, no problems at all. But when you're operating radio, you're gonna to climb to the top of that hill, and then you've gotta set up a station that could take anything from 10 minutes to 30 minutes. You're going to operate 30 minutes to maybe a couple of hours if you have a, a nice long operation, and then you've got to pack up. So you're gonna be sat on that hilltop for quite some time, and you will find your temperature drops. Just that constant breeze, that constant wind on you really saps the temperature from you. So, so having extra layers you can put on really helps. Now actually, even on some summer days when I'm doing a long operation, I put my waterproof trousers and jacket on, not to keep dry or not to keep warm, but just to keep the, the wind off me. And just that thin layer, just a, a t-shirt with a waterproof coat over the top actually keeps the wind off me and I'm absolutely fine on a sunny day. So let's look at some other things that I take with me uh, when I'm doing a, a, a climb. Some of these are permanently in my bag. Some of them are a little bit more specialist. So if you're doing something a little bit more challenging, a bit higher, um, but all of these, oh, hang on a minute, there's a glass of wine. No, the, the wine's not critical. There we go. Um, the, the, the phone's probably more critical. So all of these are, are things that I take with me um, when I'm climbing a, a summit. Now we talked already about a map. I create a map for my own use. I mark where I'm going to park. I mark the path that I'm intending to take to the summit. I work out where my activation zone is and I take this with me. I typically print this out and put it in a little A4 plastic um, sleeve that I can roll up and put in my pocket. And it supplements the mapping application that I've got on my phone. But the other really important reason for using printing something like this out is that I leave this with somebody else. I have an emergency contact who knows that I'm going to be on a hillside um, and I tell them what, where I'm going to park, what time I'm going to leave that car park, what time I think I'm going to get to the summit, how long I think I'm going to stay there and then what time I think I'm going to get back. Now this is important because although 
some summits were quite lucky in this country. We do have reasonably good um, radio cell, uh, sorry, phone cell coverage, um, but uh, someone stupidly thought to put mountains in the middle of nowhere. Who would have, who would have done that? Um, so we don't always have phone coverage and it's, sometimes it's very difficult to be able to get in touch with someone to say you're okay. Uh, in fact, when I did this operation, I couldn't even reach anyone from the, uh, from the car park. I had to drive um, another 30 minutes before I came into uh, telephone coverage. So having uh, something like this, as soon as I get off the mountain or as soon as I get to phone coverage, I can ring someone to say I'm safe. If they don't hear from me, they can phone the emergency services, tell them where I'm parked. The emergency services can go there, see if my car is still there. And if it is, they know I'm somewhere out on this trail. And because they've got a map, they can now go and see and, and follow the route that they think I'm going to take um, and, and to see if they can find me. So, so it's a good safety feature, especially if you're climbing on your own. And a lot of radio operators do. Now, communication is quite key. Um, most of us take a mobile phone. As I've just said, you, you just can't guarantee that you're going to have phone coverage. But also, if you're using your phone for um, satellite tracking, for um, taking selfies, for filming yourself, taking photographs, um, for logging, for spotting yourself, it's very easy to run the, the battery down on these things. And as I discovered in my last operation, when you get up into really cold conditions, minus 10 chill, wind chill, uh, batteries actually start to fail. My battery went from 70% um, down in the, uh, the shadow of the hill to about 20% when I was up in the freezing cold. So batteries can be affected. So I like to take another form of communication. I normally take a little two meter handheld with me. Now it doesn't mean you're gonna be able to reach anyone, but it is a backup. It's something else to have just in case. And I've yet to work um, a summit where I couldn't reach someone on two meters. So it's a good thing to have. A point to note, if I'm actually going to operate on two meters on a summit, I either take another radio or I have a spare battery. I don't use my emergency radio, my emergency comms to, to work the summit because otherwise I'm likely to run my battery down. Right, if you do get stuck, if the worst happens, if something goes wrong, the most important thing is A, someone's gonna come and look for you because you've told someone where you're going to be and you haven't got in contact with them. You need to stay warm, dry, hydrated. So I take a little emergency sack. This orange thing is um, basically, it's like a, a thick plastic sleeping bag. It doesn't give you any warmth at all. That's up to your, your clothing, your layers, but it does protect you from the wind, protect you from the rain. It's nice and bright. And mine comes with emergency instructions on there as well, which is quite handy. Um, there's some survival instructions to tell you uh, what to do. So uh, a lot of people use bothy bags. Um, that's like a little tent uh, for two or more people. And I find if you're, if you're traveling with someone else, they can be really good. You sit in them uh, facing each other and lean back. Um, it, uh, and then it, it pulls nice and tight around you. They can actually be quite good if it's pouring with rain on a hilltop. You can just get inside and, and do your SOTA activation from inside, just keeps you dry. If you're on your own, bothy bags tend to be a little bit on the big side. They flap around in wind um, and can be very exhausting. So I find the sack just a bit nicer. I sling it in the bottom of my bag. It lives there with a little emergency whistle that literally costs like a pound. Again, if I fall in in a ditch, I can blow that to raise awareness of my position to people. Right, little med kit. Hopefully you won't need this, um, but be aware I've sliced fingers on barbed wire fences, putting up and down masts, so you can have minor injuries. Um, so it's worth just taking some little basics with you. Um, I also carry tick tweezers in mine. Um, apologies, tick. Um, if uh, a tick is an insect, so for those who maybe that's a new word for you, um, a tick is an insect. So we certainly have them in the UK, um, in in uh, in grass night door. They bite and suck blood, but if you don't take them off carefully, um, you can tear the head off inside, uh, still inside you and, and get infected. So I, I take a special pair of tweezers for removing those. 
The other thing is that I found a medical bandage actually makes for a really good strap to hold your mask to a fence post when you find you've forgotten your Velcro straps. And um, small bandages, small plasters um, are like little bits of PVC tape. So when you need a little bit of tape to hold your mask up or hold a, an aerial to the top of a mask, um, plasters do do the job quite nicely. So um, I'm sure that's not how you're supposed to use it, but it, but it is quite useful. Now I've put a light on here. I do not recommend ever operating SOTA at night. Uh, let me let me say that again. Operating hills after dark is dangerous. Um, it, I've done it. I've done what I felt was a familiar hill. But coming down a hill after you've been operating for a few hours, you're cold, you're tired, your legs aren't working. If you're very cold, your brain isn't working very well. You can't see your footing clearly with a, a head torch. Um, and I've certainly tripped. I've put my twisted my ankle in a, in a rabbit hole coming down the hill. You just can't see the, the dangers when you're coming down a steep incline. So I highly recommend you don't um, operate SOTA after dark. However, being prepared, it's a good thing to have a torch in your bag just in case you get stuck, get lost, can't move and have to dig in for a, a few hours or wait to be rescued. You'll, you'll be grateful having a, a torch. Just put something small and light in before you go out uh, on your SOTA summit. Just check the batteries work and, um, and leave it in there and forget about it. All right, last few things. So water, um, always take water with me, even on a really short uh, trip, um, even if I don't think I'm going to need it. Again, it's just about being prepared in case something goes wrong. On a longer trip, you will need to take water with you. Um, now be careful, I tend to take bottles of water. I find those camelbacks, the, the little um, pouches that go in your backpack, they're, they're great, but you can't tell how much you've actually drunk. And it's very easy to go through that very quickly. So a couple of years ago, I did a climb of uh, Snowdon with my unicycle, I, I unicycled back down the mountain, and I used a camelback um, and I drank all the water on the way up and had nothing left to come down with. And I just didn't know how much I'd gone through. So now I take little half litre bottles of water with me, um, two to four, depending uh, you know, how, how long I'm gonna be out walking. Um, and that way I can monitor my, my water usage. I always chuck in some little energy bars. Again, it's nice just to give you a boost if you do get cold, a little bit, um, a little bit run down. Um, I talked about uh, a little bit about cold. Um, Hypothermia is, is, is really does creep up on you. It's, it's awful. You don't realise it's happening to you. Um, the, the first signs tend to be if you're logging that you struggle to write clearly. Um, then you'll find that you can't quite remember the call sign you were just given and you have to ask people to repeat call signs. Um, and, and from there it gets worse and worse. And you need to be really aware of the signs of, of hypothermia um, because it does creep up on you and your judgment starts to go when you start suffering from the cold. So be ready, be aware of the signs of it. If you do find yourself becoming hypothermic, then don't just carry on operating thinking, I've just, just another 30 minutes, get up, get warm, get moving, pack up, go home. The opposite of that is, of course, sun. <laughs> um, it's very easy on a very exposed summit in a nice cool breeze on a summer's day not to realise that you're getting baked by the sun. So tend to take um, uh, clothing that covers, covers my arms, um, a hat to keep the sun off my neck and my face, but I, I always use sun cream on my hands and face uh, just to give myself a little bit of protection. Um, and other little things like the, the, the bite stick um, are just bits and pieces that I've picked up over time. So that's a little bit about um, protecting ourselves. So we've we found our summit, we've chosen our summit, we've got ourselves all layered up with clothes and waterproof outers. We've set ourselves up with some basic safety, including telling somebody where we're going and when we're going to be there. What else before we start? Basic fitness. Climbing is not the same as walking. I can I walk to work um, every day uh, a couple of kilometres, no problems at all, nice and easy, fairly fit. It's completely different when you're climbing up and down hills. 
very, very steep inclines. They put a lot of pressure on the foot, on the um, Achilles uh, tendon, on the muscles either at the front and the back of the calf, and on the fronts of the thighs. And those, those muscles, those quads on the front of the thighs affect your kneecap, how your knees work. So they can cause pain and discomfort in your knees. If you're going to be doing a particularly challenging hill, I highly, highly recommend that you build up your physical fitness by doing small hills on a regular basis in the weeks or months leading up to it. A, a, a level one or level two point hill, you're probably not going to have any problems. But for the bigger hills, be prepared for that and be prepared for, um, for, for the strain of that. Uh, this was an interesting hill when I came to do. This is Hluith, um in Snowdonia a couple of weeks back. Um, it was uh, quite thick with snow. It doesn't actually look that bad here, but um, that was quite a snowy climb to get up to the top of Hluith. Um, it was equally snowy. Uh, just off to the left was Snowdon. Um, it's a very, very steep uh, climb to get to the, the last bit of Snowdon. Um, and it was a mixture of scree, so that's loose stone, and snow on top of it. Um, and that was really, really hard work on the legs. Now, by the time you've worked your summit, you've done all that climbing, you've sat around for a couple of hours operating, you come to walk to back down the hill, your legs are going to really feel it. And actually, people do say that the, the most likely time you're going to have an accident is on the way down. And that's because your legs are tired, they've become cramped, um, you've, you haven't done anything for a while, so you've got cold, uh, and your legs become weak. So you need to be really careful you don't twist an ankle, twist a knee when you're coming back down, down the hill. So that's just a little bit on fitness. The last thing then, we've climbed to the top of our hill and we're going to head straight for that activation zone, that summit, yeah? Mm. So when you're actually on the hill, it's sometimes not easy to see where the summit is. Now that sounds really stupid, but I've been on summits that are thick with um, woods um, and with undergrowth. I've been on a lot of summits, especially here in the UK, where you're covered in mist and low cloud. And actually finding the summit, finding the activation zone can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, it's all very well having a compass and, and being able to read a map, but if you can't see any landmarks around you and you're not sure where you are, that's not really going to help. Uh, here's where having that mapping application on your phone uh, with a built-in GPS is absolutely superb. You can tell exactly where you are, um, exactly where you're going and, and whether you're in the activation zone or not. So I do find that to be a real boon having um, a GPS on the phone. Be, be aware though, if your battery's a bit flat, use, use the map, use the GPS. When you find to where you need to be, turn off the GPS so that you don't flatten your battery. Right, so that's the climbing, that's the walking bit. So we've talked about finding our summit using the SOTA maps. We found out about researching our summit, printing out our maps, dressing appropriately, taking the right safety gear, and uh, being match fit and finding our summit. Let's, let's get on to the radio bit, because let's face it, that's, that's the bit that we're going up for, isn't it? Um, so, so let me talk a little bit about uh, radios, batteries, and aerials. Talk a little bit about voice versus CW or, or other modes indeed. A little bit about spotting and logging. And during that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about consideration for others. So radios. What is the best radio to use on a SOTA summit? Well, it's the radio that you've got. It's the radio that you already own, that you're happy to take out to a summit in a bag, that you can run off batteries and that isn't too heavy that it's going to cripple you. If you get really into it, you can start looking at something a little bit more specialist. But the best thing is just to start with what you've got. Now, if you want to use voice, so FM, SSB, you're going to probably end up um, for HF with, with something a bit bigger and heavier. So FT817 is a really popular choice, 5 watts maximum output. The KX3 um, has a little bit more, I can think uh, 10 to 12 watts um, output, a little bit more um, uh, power out. So those are two fantastic radios for that, but they are quite heavy. Um, the KX3 is about a kilogram, the FT817 is about 1.2, 1.25 kilograms. So they're not light radios, but they're multi-mode, they do everything. 
At the other end of the spectrum are nice simple CW sets, either single band or multi band. The mountain topper here uh, puts out maybe three watts, uh, which is fine for CW, that's, that's all you need, you can get away with that. Um, covers three bands uh, and weighs about 150 grams. So that's a significant saving over something big and heavy like an 817. Now, if you're only walking a few hundred meters to reach the top of a hill, it's no big deal. But if you're walking a long way, weight does start to become important. So it's something to think about. And obviously with radios like the 817 um, and using SSB or, or using higher power using a KX3, you're going to need bigger batteries. And again, that's going to introduce some weight. Now, I tend to always take two meters as um, uh, an emergency radio, but uh, of late I've been operating a few summits using two meters as well. Very effective, um, no problems all, even with just the little rubber duck antenna, but I do prefer to use a little bit of HF so I can give away chaser points and have more people chasing me from around the world. Thinking about bands, um, I like to go with at least three options. So I tend to go with 40 meters because it allows me to work both the UK and Europe. So it's a good um, local and out to, I don't know, a thousand kilometer or so um, band. So it's great for working the region that you live in um, out to a couple of countries around you. I like to take 20 um, 20 meters, 40 megs, because you can work some real DX. So I've certainly worked um, Australia, using voice, using my KX3 before on 20 meters. And I work a lot of Americans uh, when I'm on um, SOTA summits using just a couple of watts of CW as well on 20 meters. So 20 is an exciting band for, for SOTA. But you have to remember that with the band conditions as they are at the moment, and if you have a, um, you know, a solar activity, coronal mass ejection, 20 can be closed. You can find there's nothing there. If you have a, um, uh, a contest on if you're operating at the weekend there's contests every weekend now and um, you can find that your little qrp um, sota signal can be lost in the noise if you're on a traditional band like 40 meters and 20 meters so as well as those two bands i like to take one more i like to take a walk band so 30 meters uh, 17 meters or 12 meters um, now 12 is probably a bit high at the moment, that's um, not, not a lot of activity there. If you want to do voice, it's got to be 17 metres. If you're doing CW, then maybe 30 metres is a, is a better choice. So taking three bands, and that gives me all the choice I need. So there's a little bit about radios. Um, let's look at antennas. So we... I said about using a handheld, you can get away with a little rubber duck on a um, two meter handheld without any problems on a, a summit. If you like, you could just add a little counterpoise, just put a meter of wire attached to the, um, the outer of the aerial connector, just to give you a little bit more efficiency. But to be honest, I prefer to use an actual external antenna just to be a little bit more efficient. This is um, an old design from Sota Beams. Uh, basically, this is a, a two meter dipole. So it's, uh, it's about um, two meters of coax, uh, wrapped around a bit of 20 mil conduit to create a, a ballon, and then the inner and outer are split inside. And basically you can turn this into a vertical. And here it is um, up on Aaron Summit. And uh, this means I can tuck down out of the wind behind these rocks and my antenna's stuck up nice and high or if you're doing a bit of SSB, you can set the same antenna up as a, as a horizontal. So this is quite effective. And having an external antenna, I think for two meters, just gives you that little bit of more boost with your signal. For HF, you really cannot go wrong with a dipole. The great thing with a dipole is you can cut it to be tuned for the bands you want and you don't have to take an ATU with you. You don't want the extra weight, the extra complexity, um, the extra need for, for patch leads of an ATU. It's, it's, you're going to forget something, something's going to go wrong. So stick with a nice simple dipole if you like. This is a linked dipole. You can see the insulating links there with little crock clips that, that short them out. I'm using a... Sota Beam's telescopic fishing pole here. 
um, as, a, as a mast. Now this one's 10 meters. Um, the six meter versions are really cheap, uh, but the only downside is they, they only collapse down to about a meter long, which is too big for a bag, so you have to carry them. The thing I love about this travel mast from Soda Beams is it drops down to about half a meter long, um, 50 centimeters. So I can actually put this in my backpack um, or wedge it in the side. In fact, if I go to the picture above, you can see my mast there in the side of my backpack. The only downside is it weighs over a kilogram. I think that's about 1.3 kilograms. So it's very heavy. People often talk about using trees and other available things at the top of hills to put up a, an antenna. I'm gonna tell you now from user experience, it, it's not a great idea. To, to find a hill with a tree on that's in the right place, with the right type of tree, with a branch at the right height, clear of other obstacles that you can actually get a line over the top of is, is fairly rare. So I like to take my own mast with me. Uh, this one, I can either use these Velcro straps to attach it to a, um, a post. So if I'm near a fence, I can use a fence post. That's, that's really good. Um, but otherwise, this can be a self-supporting dipole. I use the two dipole elements, which are just quite a thin wire as two of my guys. And then I take a, uh, another piece of string to act as the third guy. So again, I'm reducing the number of things I have to carry. Um, I'm using RG174, quite a light coax um, as the feed. You might think, well, you know, isn't that inefficient? Um, but for the, for the short length I'm going to use, 10, 12 metres, um, it, it really doesn't attenuate the signal that much. Um, this pole can support this quite, quite well. Uh, if it's in very high winds with this coax hanging on it, what I tend to do is use a little bit of tape, um, four or five positions up the pole just to tape the coax to the pole and that stops it all um, bending around and, and tapping and making a noise, uh, which is quite effective. Now that, that antenna um, with the temp pegs, the kite winders, uh, all in a bag, weighs about 600, 650 grams. If I want to go really lightweight, um, I use my end-fed half wave. Uh, now I've got a design for this on my, my website, which you can look at, but uh, basically this is just a very short piece of coax, which connects to the radio. This has got a little um, impedance matching unit in it, and then I just use a length of wire, which is a half wavelength on the band I want to use. What you can't see is this is actually a multi-band version and I've got Soto Beam's Pico traps um, on the other side of this wire winder, which are tiny little traps. So this is actually a three band, 20, 30 and 40 meter end fed half wave. And I mount the center of this on the top of my mast and I put it up in, in an inverted V fed from one, one end. And this is super lightweight and actually I have to say it's been really really effective on the hilltops. Um, that's a little bit lighter then so the I said the dipole was about 650 grams this is about 250 grams so that really saves a little bit of weight especially if you're doing a bit of walking. So last thing then batteries and morse keys. So in the Bad old days, I used to carry up one of those lead acid, sealed lead acid slab batteries, seven amp hour, they weigh a ton. They're really good, I can't knock them, but they weigh a lot. Um, fortunately, with modern battery technology, you have some other options. The Li-Fi Post, this is a lithium iron, Mm, um, phosphate is it, battery? Uh, so, so that is, um, it's a four cell and it can give us 12 volts, 12.8 volts um, fully charged. Actually, it tends to be a little bit over that fully charged, about 13.2 volts, which is perfect for most of our radios. Um, this is one that I use with the KX3 or the FT817 and that 4.2 amp hour will run an 817 for about four hours in a contest. So that gives you an idea of the, the power density that you have there. The other little batteries here are LiPos um, and they are three cell, which is 11.1 .1 volts. 
Um, now actually when these are fully charged they're at about 12.5 but they, they gradually drop down to 11.1. .1. It's a little bit low for for some radios but if you went for a four cell version that, that gets you up to 15 to 16 volts which is a bit high. Um, you can go for that and put diodes um, in to, to volt drop a little bit but uh, for my little CW radios I find the little 11.1 .1 volt LiPos are perfect. The thing I've just got back here I'll just mention is um, from Soda Beams it's a um, uh, a phone pole I think they call this so it's an Anderson power pole distribution unit so I can plug a battery in and then feed two things from it but the most important thing is it has a little um, USB charger output and when I remember I can take um, a charging lead for my phone and if I need to I can plug in one of my batteries and put a bit of charge into my phone so if I've been using it for logging GPS everything else and I've run it down it gives me a little bit of an emergency boost for my uh, for my phone. The last thing then I want to talk about here is keys so I, I actually enjoy doing CW and I love operating CW from Hilltops. I was very nervous when I first started with SOTA because when you call CQ SOTA um, you can get a lot of people come back to you um, and suddenly you find yourself at the bottom of a pileup and I was really worried about whether I was going to be able to manage that in CW but actually as you're the DX you get to control things so you can go at whatever speed you like and pace the, the whole thing how you like so, so actually I find CW really really effective for SOTA. I have two favourite setups one is using paddles one is using a straight key for paddles I really love the um, the Pico paddles and sorry this is a Pico paddle and a mini paddle from Palm Paddles in Germany. These are super little keys really lightweight when you're not using them the paddles retract inside the case so it protects them in transit um, and the mini is great because you can hold it in one hand and then operate the paddles with the other hand. If I want to do a bit of fixed uh, a bit of straight key um, what I tend to use is this old, I think it's a Lancaster bomber, what they call a bathtub key. This is in completely enclosed. The idea was that the spark from the key wouldn't ignite the fumes in the airplane and, and blow, the, um, blow the plane up uh, in transit. Um, but what it means is it's also completely proof of mud, grass, rain, uh, keeps all the elements out. So it's a great little key for, 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 for using for SOTA. Right, so last thing then, let's get on to um, spotting and logging. So you can just go to a hill and call CQ SOTA and you will get people pick you up. But if you want to be like proper DX, if you spot yourself, you'll find chasers from around the world will go out of their way to try and work you. So it's a great way of bringing in lots of traffic. We talked about um, if you're chasing using the SOTA um, website for, uh, for going and, and looking at the spots. Um, and if you have a good data connection, you can use your phone to connect to sotawatch.org um, and post spot yourself in the normal way using the website. But if you haven't got a good data connection, but you have got marginal coverage, and here you can see I've only got one bar of um, coverage from Vodafone, you can use SMS to spot yourself using a, a gateway. You have to register for this, but it means that then I can just text a very simple string. The exclamation gives my call sign, uh, followed by the summit reference, which doesn't include any punctuation. I put the frequency that I'm using, the mode I'm using, and then I can put a, a string of information, um, whatever, uh, information I want to and that gets automatically spotted. So it's a great way of spotting where you haven't got good phone coverage. Logging. Now some people like to paper log, some people like to electronic log. Um, I'm a, a paper logger. When I'm on a hillside I like to keep it nice and simple. I use paper and pencil. I, do, I avoid pens. Pens can stop working in the wet and they can stop working in the cold. But a pen and pencil never breaks down. These days you can get waterproof papers so it means you can um, carry on logging even in the pouring rain. But I, I just use little notebooks and I've never had any problems with rain. Try to avoid using big notepads. Summits can be very very windy. It's hard to control a sheet of paper. So a little notepad is really good. 
you'll notice that I've got a little bit of a little flap of paper out here to one side and, and what I do is I, I write important information about the summit on that. That's got the summit reference, summit name, locator uh, and information like that and that means that I can flip it out when I'm logging and if I turn a page I can still see this information. I even have to put sometimes things like my call sign is slash P because otherwise I forget it. Or if I'm operating in a different area like Wales, I need to use golf whiskey instead of just golf. Um, and it's very easy to forget. So I write information like that on it. James, this is James M0JCQ. He likes to electronic log. Um, he's using a tablet here. He's had to put it in a waterproof case to, um, to s save it from the elements. I think it's, it makes it quicker when you get home, you can upload your log electronically, but the downside is if you're in very bright sunlight, um, you can get glare from the screen. If you're in very cold or wet conditions, the touch sensitivity can be a little bit problematic. So uh, it, it's horses for courses. You have to decide what you like to do. And for me, it's paper. Um, for other people, it's gonna be electronic logging. Now, just to finish up on the, the health and safety aspects of working on a, a hilltop, I said earlier about the, the concept of the activation zone being quite big so that we don't have to be too close to the general public. And you do have to be aware of that. Hilltops are a bit crazy. Um, you can have people with kids running around, with dogs running loose. Um, if you've got an antenna up, uh, people can't necessarily see the guy lines. Um, they can't see uh, where it's coming down. Uh, animals will run into it. I've had this experience. Um, and, and if you've got kids, they don't know what it is. They can get close to it. Even at QRP levels, you can have some quite high RF voltages there. So you just have to be a little bit considerate about other people using a hilltop when you're activating it and, and, and try and keep away from people. And if necessary, stop operating when other people are about. Okay, so we have found our hill. We've climbed it successfully. We've activated it, we've spotted ourselves, we've logged a few contacts. Importantly, to formally activate a hill, you have to have had at least four contacts. You can't have a contact with someone else on the same hill and you can't have a contact through a repeater. Although that said, you can have a contact through a satellite, which is a bit like a repeater, but it's far more challenging. So you have to have at least four contacts to have um, officially activated a hill. So when you get home and you get your feet up in front of the fire and your cup of cocoa to warm up, what you need to do to finish off your activation is to upload your log at sotadata.org.uk. So you go to submit log and if you have done this electronically, you can export a comma separated variable version and upload it straight away. If you're like me and you've paper logged, you have to type them in one at a time. That's normally doesn't take very long if I'm honest. As you can see here, you don't have to put um, signal reports in, you literally just put the time, the call sign. For the first one you set the band and the mode and then click add and from that point on you only have to put the time and the call sign. You enter all your log, click finish and at the end of this process you get a score for activating the summit and anyone you've worked or any shortwave listeners who also want to try and claim an award and um, who heard you, they can use this database to verify that you did actually have a contact when you said you did. Um, and then you, if you want to, you can look at the results, view results to see where you are in a big leaderboard um, of people. Uh, and, and where you score either from a chaser perspective, so you can have a chaser score, where you score as an activator, so you can have an activator score. And finally, they have something called a summit to summit score. So if I climb a summit and I work somebody else on a summit, that's, that's classed as a special contact. And we can, um, we can earn specific points for that and earn certificates for that. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That was a whistle stop tour of SOTA, Summits on the Air, and activating uh, a summit. So just to summarise, there's chasers, there's activators, and you can actually get a lot of pleasure from doing either. If you're going to be an activator, and that's where the fun is for me, you need to think about the walking side and the radio side separately. Be safe walking, dress well, 
take that emergency gear, let somebody know where you're going to be and when you're going to be. Be considerate of others working on the summit, have a lot of fun. On the radio side, try not to forget your power lead, <laughs> try not to forget your aerial, and you will find yourself acting just like DX with a massive pile up of people trying to get you in their log and earn points for, for working you. It's incredibly exciting and incredibly fun and I can't recommend it enough to everyone.